with the bosses at RKO Studios. First of all, they asked me if I, why, if I, why I hadn't had my nose fixed. And I just simply said it hadn't occurred to me I could breathe through it fairly well. Then we're going to change my name to Robert Marshall. And, uh, you know, they thought the, like, Taylor, Gable, Garland, you know. And the man who uh, wanted to change my name was named Herman Schlum. So he uh, changed his son's name to Marshall Schlum. And everything worked out. What was your first contract? 40 weeks out of 52 for $350 a week. What was your first film for Arcade? The first one I was in drag, actually, in the beginning of the picture. You look good to me. Well, I had a, you know, sort of a, a prairie style uh, flouncing skirt, and I was done up in drag. You for me, ma'am. I like a big. Well, now they don't come too big for me either, bud. <laughs> That's good. Got a voice to match your figure. I'm buying you the first drink, sweetie pie. It was sort of like a club, RKO. They had uh, commitments, expensive commitments, you know, like with uh, Cary Grant, Crosby, people like that. And uh, then they had what was oh, more or less a, a B factory, which we did. We had the Westerns, and uh, Larry Turney did Dillinger, and, you know, that, or that sort of thing. You know? And it was, you know, just a good functioning factory. The f crew was very familiar. We worked with the same crew more or less all the time. And it was uh, sort of down home. What sort of areas could you choose how, what you wanted? Could, where you, could you choose the directors you wanted to work with? Could you... Really makes no difference. No difference? Still doesn't. You don't believe that the director makes the picture? I have no idea. Possibly he does, you know. But I have the same uh, general attitude that uh, John Houston taught me. And Johnny said, uh, they want the bad pictures, we can, we can make them too, kid. They want them bad, we can make them cost a little more, but if they want them bad, we can make them bad. It doesn't concern me. In 1948, Mitchell was arrested for possession of marijuana. Federal Narcotics Bureau said they had been watching him for some time, eight months in all. He was sentenced to 60 days in jail. It did have an effect on your career, did it not, though? I, it uh, probably, yeah, it made it a bit more circus. Well, I couldn't play, for instance, Eagle Scouts or uh, Baptist Preachers. Or, but uh, I tell you one thing, it uh, certainly enlisted an enormous number of new fans. Everybody thought that was the end of Mitchum's career. Well, it wasn't at all. Mitchum, uh, Everybody was kind of fascinated by this. Now, maybe if it had been Farley Granger or some attractive young uh, guy with a different kind of image, it would have been a different thing. But Mitchum, they like they like Mitchum to be a little dangerous, a little rec reckless, a little the kind of things that he he was. That's the character he played, and that's the kind of person he was. Perhaps as a result of his arrest, Mitchum found himself gravitating towards film noir and a period of mostly tough guy roles that tapped into his reputation as a bad boy. But there was much more to him than that, as was demonstrated in later films like The Sundowners and Heaven Knows Mr. Allison. Both featured the English rose, Deborah Carr, who called Mitchum her favorite co-star. In 1969, Mitchum was in Ireland, working on Sir David Lean's film, Ryan's Daughter. He was interviewed on location by Film Night's Tony Bilbo in what wasn't the easiest encounter of the reporter's career. Robert Mitchum, when you're offered a film, you're said to look at the contract to see how many days you get off. Not the contract, look at the script. See how many days off I get. Was this a good script from that point of view? It was, but I was led down the garden path, you see. When I'm not working, I'm standing by. I'm under house arrest. <laughs> Do you find this irksome? Rather, yeah. yeah. There's a kind of legend about you which you 
help to perpetuate, I think, that um, you walk through your parts, that you don't really take your career or yourself very seriously. Value for value received. Could you explain that a bit more? Well, you know, they can have it any way they want it if they want it. But we make bad pictures, too. It costs a little more, but they're convinced that, you know, they're insistent upon dull, bad, dreary making. I can't help feeling that this is a facade, um, and that behind it all, you really are a dedicated actor. Is I am indeed. I'm desperately dedicated. Very you... sensitive to criticism or frustration. I will cry myself to sleep at night. I've already designed a monument for myself. What form will it take? I cannot tell you that. Someone's liable to steal it. <laughs> Somebody once said that uh, dignity has ruined more actors than drink. Do you agree with that? I think John Barrymore said that. Dignity or uh, trained voices. But uh, what I'm really getting at is, you see, I wonder whether this is what is behind what I still think of as a facade, that underneath all this, you take your profession very seriously Very indeed. seriously. <laughs> they are sending me up again. But you're... Well, that's what you said it, not I. <laughs> I think you take it very seriously, but you like to pretend that you don't. OK. Would you agree? No, but... Uh... All right, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Somebody like Humphrey Bogart, who I admired very much as an actor, who is generally agreed, I think, to have been a very fine actor, one of the finest we ever had. And yet he, like you, used to give the impression that he didn't give a damn about his job. No, no. He was a professional actor. From nine till six, after that, he was a Bogart, you know, just himself. Ah, so now we have it. Do you, would you admit that you're a professional actor? when I'm paid uh, during working hours. <laughs> I think you did once say that if you could, you'd rather write than act. Well, I, I had proposed to write. I began as a writer, but uh, I was seduced and you know, led down the garden path and became a movie actress instead. <laughs> when did this seduction take place? June 1942. I needed $500, and I found it. But how did this happen? I mean, you didn't, you didn't just suddenly walk into a film studio. No, but uh, somebody had said if I'd ever wanted to do anything professionally, I wanted to let them know and they'd see if they could get me a job. So I did. It was an economic expedient. I needed the money. Mm -hmm. It was also very lucky in a way because you came in at the tail end of the era of the matinee idol. Mm. So that you... I came on with the ugly leading man. <laughs> well, you said it, I didn't. That's right. I got out of the army, there I was. You know, in profile all the time. So did, did you feel that you were very much in the right time? At the, no, the right I just, uh, I began as a, sort of as a character actor. I began on the Hopalong Cassidy's, all beard, very little dialogue, you know. hundred dollars a week and all the horse manure I could carry home. It was great playing cowboys and Indians and picnicking out in the field. All right. And I just stayed on the tit, that's all. I, I don't want to pursue this any more than I need, but there's just one extra thing I'd like to ask you. Somebody once said of you that there's very little chance that your real talent as an actor will be revealed, because that would mean exposing more of your real personality. It's quite possible, yeah. Well, could you give me just a little bit of you self You said it. <laughs> well, what are, what are the things that you're afraid of exposing? Nothing at all, really. It's just a matter of, of uh, further involvement and complication, just personal involvement. And you don't want to be involved? I don't want to charm anyone, no. No, we're not talking about charm. I don't want to interest anyone. No, but as an actor, you, you've as... admitted you're a dedicated actor, a professional no, actor. No, no, I'm a, you know, I'm a professional actor, that's all. I've got a union card that says so. And a job that says so. Mm. That's the end of it. Yes, but... As much as anyone need know, as far as I, I mean, you know, in my feeling. Are you aware of certain facets of your character or personality that you instinctively dislike? Oh, yes, the dark, dismal depths of depravity that I hide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wish to exhibit the children, you know. 
<laughs> no, but, all right, you're, you're making a joke of it, but is, is, is it possible, there's a little bit of truth in that, that, that if I, you really... I'm sure no more than in anyone else, I don't know. I no, mean, I, I, I don't recar rec regard myself, uh, I mean, I don't have a... I'm not a thief, and I'm not a compulsive liar or cheat. I don't think that I burden anyone else with my, with my uh, shortcomings or, or my sins. As I say, at six o'clock, I just shut off and go home. Well, let's take a more superficial uh, picture of you, the image produced by the films of the tough he-man. Um, and like a lot of other stars uh, of, of your kind, uh, who have this image, um, a lot of people in private life like to take a swing at you, take a punch at you. What, what, do, what do you do in, this, in, in those situations? Fall down. <laughs> but, I mean, do you never retaliate? Never happens, really, or very rarely happens. But, I mean, you, you have this reputation in the press anyway. Uh, oh, well, you know, according to the press, Tom Dewey is president, you know, and all sorts of things. Because mm. in the past, you've had to live down some rather unfortunate publicity. I'm thinking of that knock narcotics charge some years ago. And the a conspiracy charge. Conspiracy charge? Yes, which was later dropped, rescinded, and I received the clean bullet health and a letter of apology. No one ever published that because it didn't sell any newspapers. Did you feel bitter about that? Not at all. Didn't mind. Then there was the very silly blown up thing about the Cannes Film Festival when some starlet... I had nothing to do with that. No, I, I know you didn't. I mean, she flung herself into arms um, and she took her the top, took her bra off. And there was a she was going off. for the load, but uh, I opted out. But I, I wonder, do you think, to, to what extent would you take responsibility for that kind of thing happening to you? Well, just the, the uh, being a public freak, you know, being a, a zoo animal on the loose, that's all. There was a time when you said that you wouldn't care if you never made another picture at all. I said that the first day I ever went to work. That, uh, I was never starry-eyed and fascinated by the magic of the movies. You know. Take the money and run. So what would you do if, if you suddenly found that the offers weren't coming in? Weep, I suppose. All the way to the bank. Like Tony Bilbo, Michael Parkinson would also find Mitchum to be one of his more challenging guests. Parkinson later wrote that Mitchum had been up to his old tricks, smoking something exotic just before the interview, and thought this was one reason why it went the way it did. Good evening and welcome. My special guest tonight is one of the cinema's superstars. He's made so many films that he claims to have stopped counting after 130. In a changing industry, he's remained a constant, a, a fixture, defying the ebb and flow of a shifting world. He once claimed that the only thing he changed since going to Hollywood was his underwear. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Mitchum. I really can't see all those people. I guess I better... <laughs> <laughs> they can right. see you, that's the important thing. You always have. Yeah. The frightening thing. Well, you're, you're not nervous, are you, about appearing in front of a live audience? Yes, I am. That's as steady as a rock. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, don't you like a live audience? Don't you like the sort of feel of it? I come from Los Angeles, a rock is not so steady. <laughs> <laughs> How is it, do you think, that you've... Uh, I said in the intro there that you've been, or you are, one of Hollywood's most durable stars. You've had a long career and it's not fluctuated. I mean, why is it, do you think, that you've remained so constant and durable? I should think just that endurance, you know, just general durability. You know, some of them fell dead from playing tennis, found in bed with a blonde, you know. <laughs> some were lost at sea. And I just... Uh, you don't play tennis? I don't leave the house too much. <laughs> Why do you think, though? I mean, to be serious, we came for a moment. I mean, have you ever tried to analyze your popularity? One time, I guess it was the first time that my wife and I went to Rome, and we met an Italian journalist, a lady, and uh, 
she said, well, you have no problems at all walking through the streets of Rome. We were going down window shopping on the Via Condotti and staying up at the Hassler Hotel at the top of the Spanish stairs. And she cited, you know, the appearance and sort of walkabout of Gary Cooper and uh, Bogart and on and on. And she said, oh, no. She said, the Italian people have great respect for uh, the artiste. I said, okay, fine. So we went off and we wound up being sort of boxed in in the middle of the Via Condotti with about 2,000 people, blocking both ends. And there's a big smiling Carabinieri standing next to me, and I went on speaking Polish for two hours. And <laughs> finally, some guy jumped up, and he said, well, he's been very kind. Very, and my wife was hiding in a doorway back across the street. And they just, you know, the fellow sort of let me off the hook. He said, he's been very kind. He's given up of his time. And he said, I think we should let him go. So they finally turned me loose. Great cheers from the crowd, and we marched back up, back on up the stairs, and back to the hotel, and we met this newspaper woman. And I told her of my experience, and uh, I said, I guess they don't consider me, you know, uh, a grand artiste. Oh, yes, she said, the great, they have great respect for you, really great artiste, but with the common touch. <laughs> they, <laughs> thanks a lot. So they feel they can hit you, you know, and speak to you. Those other cats, are they stand in awe of, but you, they do, can touch. Do you think that's true, though? I'm afraid it is true, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Wonder why is it then? I mean, well, because I've been just about every place everyone else has, you know, except good. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I pretty much know what it's like. Mm. And I've spent most of my life sort of giving odd asides from the balcony. And uh, I think people pretty well understand what I'm talking about. Mm. Do you mean that they, they sort of look at you and identify with you? They can, uh, well, if the dialogue is really bad, you know, I s speak the dialogue and then turn straight around to the audience like Jack Benny. So how about that? You know, I mean, <laughs> really, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty well understood that I, you know, I uh, go to work in the morning and I come home at night, God willing, and uh, I have I reserve my own attitudes about what I'm doing. Yes. yes. I mean, I, I remember one time in New York at the Paramount Theater, and they have that stage that goes right. down at the end, and this was right after or during sort of the Sinatra period, you know, that period. And I had been there with Frank, and I watched this whole thing. And uh, I did. I stood on the stage and said, well, now that's about the end of it. We've done our gig, and that's it. And I said, now this foul film comes on. And I've seen it, and I would advise you to just split. <laughs> and then nobody left. Nobody left. Nobody <clears throat> left. They just creamed, you know, said, got to see it. But RKO didn't send me on too many more exploitations. Well, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned there this thing about being boxed in in Rome. Does this uh, lack of privacy, does it uh, annoy you? It's not a lack of privacy. Well, it's frightening. It's frightening. Yeah. You know, you can't. See, that many people all headed in your direction without uh, having some vague memory of a lynch mob. <laughs> because you can't find, you really can't believe in your heart that there are that many people who mean you well. <laughs> <laughs> Not in concert, really. No. Among no. them, there's got to be some cut purse or some stabber. And it's a kind of, you know, Nervous making, I think. But I mean, if you ever took it to its extreme, though, I mean, if you ever really thought about it before you went out, you'd never go out, would you? So, I mean, how do you. I don't do... much, really. You don't much go out? No, I don't, no. No, I go out and drag a few times, you know, for time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. We've got, we, yeah. we got a well, dicey it's... musician over there. <laughs> There's no such thing as a dicey musician. They're dicey from birth. And <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you, in fact, um, you see, you said earlier on that you, uh, you regard what you do as a job. You go in the studio, you turn and you go home. I mean, do you, do you enjoy it, though? Do you enjoy of making course, movies? Of course, of course. Certainly, you know, I, I find myself telling, I have always found myself telling other people, other sort of novitiates, that um, who, who find themselves very awkward in the presence of, a, you know, 120 crew and general technicians, and uh, they freeze up, you know, they become inhibited. And I said, look, it's your turn, and all these people are here for you, really. They're on your side. And, and the, once that's understood, then the ambience of, of you know, it's, it's the only truly communal business. Everybody gets together for you at that time. And it works very well. Mm. And it, I sort of, my sort of, my mature life was uh, 
in that climate, in that atmosphere, and I, I must say I'm very grateful for it, really, because I found, uh, well, a great deal of human concern that people are just not ordinarily, um, ordinarily exposed to, and I'm very grateful for it. Mm. I, I, you know, I think it's an improvement. It helps growth. Mm. But what about what about the movies the, themselves? I mean, you made a, a hell of a lot, haven't you? More well, than most. <clears throat> you know, you propose in front that that uh, this is dumb or that's stupid or that's you know, uh, and they they argue. They don't even argue, really. They draw up, and uh, they pay. They steal, but they pay. So uh, if, if you want less than the best, fine. I'm very well prepared to give less than the best. If that's your game, good, really. Really? You mean you don't? Why not? <coughs> well, well, I wouldn't want to embarrass <coughs> a producer by being better than he expected me to be. <laughs> would I? Would I? No, but you, like, you might like to satisfy yourself to be as good as you know you can be. I satisfy myself when it's dark. <laughs> Later. Is that I satisfy myself that I outlive them, out-enjoy them, outperform them. Do you always want to be a, a, a movie star? Somebody? No, I wanted to be queen. <laughs> No, I didn't. I ne it never occurred to me. I couldn't make it. I couldn't make the weight. Couldn't make the weight. <laughs> no, I, uh, it never occurred to me until it came up, you know. Well, this extraordinary very background that you had, how did you eventually arrive in movies? Did they find you? Well, it was an economic expedient. I needed the job. My wife was going to have a baby, and I needed $500, and I... Just went up and knocked on the door and asked him if they were taking any hands in the acting department. And he said, well, not. That was it. I went to work. And you worked on what Hopper on Cassidy movies? Never looked you? back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a hundred dollars a week and all the horse manure I could carry home. <laughs> Couldn't beat that with a stick. Yeah. Well, I mean, how long did it take to shoot those movies in those days? They do. We made uh, two pictures, I think, in 21 days. I think that's what it was. That's going so. We went out and did the locations. No, we, no, we did the interiors for one, then did both exteriors and you know changed casts in the middle and came back into the interiors for the second. Yeah. So the location trip served for both films. Yeah. I suppose the, the, the first film that really lifted you out of that, well, and got you a lot of recognition was the story of G.I. Joe. I suppose it, it was. Yeah. Some people say 30 seconds over Tokyo. Some people say it was my picture in the Police Gazette. You know. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it was. If you say so, I guess it was. No, I only, I only, I only say so. I mean, you, you surely Because other that. people say so. No, 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 not at all, because it's the only picture you were nominated for an Academy Award for. Ah. 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 That impresses me. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Right. I just wonder what you thought about Academy Awards and nominations. It has really not, not much to do with me. If someone should call me up and say, you just got the Academy Award, I'd jump up and down and go and tell her you put a sign outside the window. You know. <laughs> but other than that, I really don't know much about it. I mean, you don't take George Scott's attitude about it. I mean, he's anti antagonistic toward the, the whole system. Well, he, ha he has a position, you know. He has a position of antagonism. I have no position at all. There it is, you know. I, It's like a choice of restaurants, or I don't know. It, I, I'm sure that it's valid and very important, and it's important to people who uh, who are, you know, every year we give each other awards. You're okay, Charlie, you know, and uh, which is good enough, you know, sort of a private club patting each other on the head, and uh, if you. If you uh, wear out a lot of foot leather or spend at least part of your time in seeking further jobs and further work, and then it's a good thing to have in your portfolio. Academy Award winner or Knight, Golden Gloves 193, you know. But uh, if you don't care, then it really doesn't help much, does it? Mm -hmm.
What about the, the, the changes that uh, you've seen in the industry, Mr. Mitchum, over the, the years? I mean, uh, the only thing I've noticed is they call me sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, uh, Mr. Mitchum, sir, or Mr. Mitchum. You know, they used to call me, hey, Rob, uh, would you get your over here? And uh, that's about the only changes I've seen. That and the, the sort of cyclical return to amateurism, which is you know, largely prevalent now. And I should think that out of it, you know, comes hard-working young people with uh, a sense of doing, and they do it. I suppose that they eventually will wind up being the relatives of the needle trades advocates, you know, who built Hollywood, and on and on, I suppose. You, know, I'm you mean in a sense that nothing is new, but it just keeps... Not really, mm. not really, you know, because all the giants were built out of really uh, trash catchers, you know, who sold it back to you in wholesale lots and made you pay for it. <laughs> and. You know, I mean, that, that, and that wasn't too bad, was it? So I would think that, uh, you know, that a new group coming in with all the waste and all the amateurism should develop some straight, good movie makers because I, I'm convinced that the audiovisual medium is, well, there's nothing else, you know, until we, until we find ourselves in some sort of a mental medium that, that transcends that. But, up until that, I should think that the audiovisual medium is better than all the languages in the world because it, I mean, people can see it, they can even make it up in their own heads. Mm. Mm. And I have great faith in it. I really do, you know. Mm. And, I, and I, I see people who progress far beyond the, the uh, material progress of it. Mm. You have sons also, don't you, who are sort of carrying on in the... Uh, Looking for the, jobs. Looking for jobs, yeah. <laughs> did you, I wonder, did, was there any uh, advice you gave them when they became actors. Just uh, remember your lines and don't write home for money. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they need to know. Neither of which they took to heart. Mm. <laughs> no, they, you know, they do as they will. That's their lives, isn't it? Mm. They could have been burglars as long as they don't get I just told them that, really. I said, whatever you do, don't get caught at it. So, <laughs> no one's ever caught me acting. <laughs> Finally, did you uh, ever contemplate retiring? This morning I did. This and, morning. And every morning. Mm -hmm. All that I am retired, really. Really? Yes. Yeah, that's why I, You keep on making movies. On my own terms, generally. And that's the best way? I would think so, yes. Mm. I would agree with you, I would think, yeah. It's kind of juicy, really. <laughs>